Hi, I'm Judy Frazier, president and founder of We The Kids. We The Kids puts God back into America's history. Listening to We The Kids radio show will inspire you and your kids to have a positive American identity, clear direction, and a powerful purpose for your life. Thank you for listening. Star-spangled banner, yet wave. O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Welcome to We The Kids Radio Show for kids from 8 to 108. I am Arch Hunter, a father, a husband, and an historian. And I'm Lydia Nuttall, a mom and executive board member for We The Kids and author of Forgotten American Stories, celebrating America's Constitution. And later on in the show, we're going to hear from the We The Kids Liberty Players. The mission of We The Kids is to put God back into America's stories to help American kids be proud to be an American, to love and defend America's constitution, and learn the principles of freedom that establish unprecedented freedom in our country so that they can preserve freedom in America. And that is so important. That's why we're doing this show. So we're glad you're listening. So today our story is why Ellis Island and what was the significance to millions of Americans? Well, my goodness, I don't know if you knew this, Arch, but did you know that over 40% of all Americans can trace their roots to Ellis Island? 40%? Lydia, that is a very high number. It totally is. It really is. It was interesting. I am here in Utah and was able to bring my daughter, who was 10 at the time, to the East Coast, and we got to go to Ellis Island. So do you know where it's at? I know it's in between New Jersey and New York in the harbor. It is, and uh, you can go there today. They give tours there. You have to ride a ferry boat to Ellis Island. The Statue of Liberty is really close by, and we'll talk on a future show about the Statue of Liberty, but uh, Ellis Island was kind of like an organized place where people who wanted to come to America came to first. Back in the day, it was established in 1892, which sounds like eons ago because it was 1892, and it closed in 1954. So for over 62 years, it was America's processing place, an organized system way where immigrants could come and enter America through Ellis Island. And we didn't have planes back then or uh, high speed powered boats, et cetera, ships. Uh, They had to come here by steamship and it would take about two weeks for them, depending on where they came from Europe across the Atlantic Ocean, to come to America. And the steamship entered the Hudson, was it the Hudson Bay? Is that? Yeah, Hudson Bay. And that's where Ellis Island is. And it's right by, yes, like you mentioned, it's by New York City and New Jersey. And so the ship would have to anchor and then the passengers un, uh, get off the ship and be ferried to Ellis Island on a smaller ship. And it was an amazing process. So there's a story that I found by Lawrence Meinwald. He was an immigrant from Poland and he remembers his experience coming to America when he was six years old. You wanna hear it? 
Absolutely. And I'm sure all our listeners would like to hear it. So he said, and I'm just quoting his words. He says, coming into New York Harbor below the deck of a ship, my father and I heard this tremendous rumble above us growing louder and louder. We couldn't identify what the noise was. It was very early in the morning. So we ran out to the deck and there were people of all denominations, some on their knees making the sign of the cross, Jews in their prayer shawls. As we were passing the statue, of Liberty. It was the first time I ever saw it. It was a great sight. So Lawrence Meinwald was an immigrant from Poland, as I mentioned, and he remembered that time coming to America. And I love when, when I heard that story, it just gave me goosebumps because it's so real. That is what so many of our own ancestors, like I said, 40% of Americans can trace their roots to Ellis Island, their own ancestors coming through Ellis Island. You can even find your ancestors. If you do research on Ellis Island records, you can find who they are and see their signatures because they had a sign and give them information as far as where they were coming from. And so we have that on hand. It's kind of exciting. My own grandmother came through Ellis Ellis Island, and I'll get to share her story at a future time. But that's the scoop on Ellis Island. So we've got the question of how come so many immigrants, millions of them, came to America back then? Over 12 million immigrants came through the doors of Ellis Island. It was our nation's, like I mentioned, our immigrant inspection station. So have any clues? Arch, do you have um, well, ancestors that came? Well, yes, my grandparents on my mother's side were immigrants that came to America from Ireland and they came through Ellis Island. And when I looked them up on their website and then when I went to Ellis Island, you can actually literally see their names. And any of our listeners who ever go to Ellis Island, Lydia, it's an overwhelming feeling to see your relatives' names on those blocks, knowing that they came to America for opportunity and have a better life and look where you know where i am two generations later and the gratitude that's there because of them wanting to come to our country isn't it amazing how it, seeing their names on those records makes them so real it sure does you, i love that you, in your book um you said that the statue of liberty ellis island the golden door to america now is that a name that the immigrants gave to Ellis Island, or is that just something that developed over time? Because that's such a, a picture, Ellis Island being the golden door to America. I've also heard it called the golden land of opportunity. I'm not really sure where all that came from, other than in my mind, I've always understood it as it was the golden land of opportunity. And Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty that the immigrants would see on their way into Ellis Island to get off the ship and come to America, that's what they termed it because it was a land of opportunity, so much opportunity that they never even had before. And, you know, it, an opportunity to have religious freedom and be able to believe whatever political affiliation you wanted to. There are so many countries where you couldn't say anything bad about whoever was ruling over you. You'd be incarcerated. You'd be locked in a dungeon somewhere. So many needed, wanted the opportunity to own their own land. It was kind of a novel thing to be able to have an opportunity to own your own land because most of the European countries, if not all, you had to be born into wealth or the aristocracy. If you were born to your father who owned land, then you would inherit that land. And, and so if you were born to someone that didn't own land, just rented land from the king or the ruler, you never could own the land. The king owned it, the emperor owned it. Um, so there were so many opportunities then to hopefully work and to prosper and to own your own land in this country. Uh, an opportunity to send your children to school. Illiteracy was huge over in the European nations. You Again, you had to be born into wealth in order to hire a tutor to educate your children or to send them away to, to school. And here in America, gosh, I know <laughs> a lot of kids at home right now that probably wished they didn't have to go to school ever, but that was a huge blessing to these people who didn't know how to read or write and could only mark their signature with an X. And 
literacy is something that's so important for every human being to be able to achieve. So to be able to come to America to have the opportunity to go to school and send your children to school was huge. And also to live in peace. Even today, how many countries can you name that are embroiled in political conflict, wars, contentions, factions? Uh, where, where can you find peace on earth today? Well, America has had lots of peace well, you know, at least we're not warring among ourselves with guns and ammunition and destroying houses and, and lands and property because of wars within our own country. We have had wars here in our own country, but they've been few and far between. Unlike a lot of countries, there's a lot of war going on. Letty, immigrants that come to our country, they know that they're going to be in for a very difficult time to acclimate into our country. Share with the listeners exactly what a lot of these immigrants gave up to come here for an opportunity to better themselves and better their own families. Well, can you imagine? Let's just switch roles for a minute. Okay, we're American and we've got most likely American listeners. Let's pretend we had no more freedom here in this country. Uh, your life was at stake because you believe something different than the mainstream. You were fearing for your life and the safety of your family. You were poor, you were illiterate. <laughs> you just rented, you didn't own anything. It belonged to somebody else and, and you had no ability to break through and to even have a chance of owning your own home, own your own land. So let's pretend we go to, I don't know, Arch, pick a country. Pick a country, any country. Uh, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan? Well, you said pick a country, buddy. I picked a country, <laughs> now you're going to question that. Okay. okay, let's pretend there's a country called Kyrgyzstan. So we're going to go to Kyrgyzstan, and they speak, they don't speak English, they speak Kyrgyzstanese. So, so now you are at a disadvantage because you don't understand what most of the people you're now living among speak. So you're going to have to speak a different, learn how to speak a different language. What kind of food do Kyrgyzstanese people eat? What do you think, Arch? Make something up. Uh, uh, rice and beef and McDonald's. <laughs> okay. So let's pretend you were used to a diet of potatoes and fish and you didn't even know what McDonald's was. So now you've got a, a difference of food um, that, that's available that you can buy. And maybe you don't even know how to cook rice because all you know how to do is boil potatoes. So you've got that. What kind of clothes are they wearing? You, you know, their clothes are most likely going to be different than what you're wearing. And for kids, that's kind of a big deal. If you want to fit in, you try to wear what everyone else is wearing or something similar. How about your family? Gosh, do we have family here in America? And now we're going to leave all our family behind, everything we've ever known, and go to this Kyrgyzstan place where we have no friends, no relatives, no anybody um, I don't know. How would you like that, Arch? <laughs> would you feel a little bit? Well, I certainly wouldn't like that. And Lydia, I, I remember my grandparents settled in New York City. My mother was actually born right on Broadway. They moved to the Philadelphia area. And then I was about four years old. They purchased their first home right outside Philadelphia. We went down to see them. And as a little kid, being four years old, I said to my grandfather that, well, your home isn't very large. And this is just the ignorance of a little kid. And he said to me, but it's a mansion compared to what we came from in, in Ireland. Wow. And, and that's th that, that has impacted me, you know, my whole life. So Lydia, why do immigrants still come to America today? I mean, we, we, we still see what we see, but why would immigrants still want to come to America today? Well, I would like to think it's for the same reasons. We still have, there are still countries there where you still can't own your own land. It's the higher up people. Maybe they have such high taxes. There's no way you could ever get ahead. Maybe they're socialist countries where the government owns and controls the means of production and over-regulates, you know, puts so many rules and regulations on you. If you're trying to run a business or get ahead that you're stymied, you're squashed like a bug. You just can't break free. You can't break through to the next level of prosperity that you want. 
And I know there, there are countries where you don't have religious freedom to believe and to worship how you would like according to the dictates of your own conscience and that you'd be persecuted if you didn't support the political what the environment the, the the political affiliation of, of those that were running the country uh, if you disagreed if, if you vocally spoke out goodness there are countries out there for sure where you you lose you could lose your life so America still has, Goodness, we still have freedom of speech in America. Just the very fact that you and I can do this radio show is freedom of speech. And I think that's awesome. So we have to be careful and make sure we preserve the freedoms that we have so that people can continue to find America as the golden land of opportunity because we have freedom here. And it's unprecedented freedom. We're not perfect as a nation. We have things in our history, just like every other country does, that we may not be proud of, but we're human beings. And, <laughs> and at least here in America, we have the freedom to keep trying and to improve ourselves as individuals, improve our communities, improve our states, whatever state we live in. And all that improves our nation and makes it more of the land of the free and an and opportunity for, for everyone. You know, George Mason, who was one of our founding fathers, and Liddy, he's one that's widely overlooked by most Americans. He actually was the father of the Bill of Rights. Let me give you one of his quotes, and then I would ask you to respond to his quote, please. His quote is, that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which, when they enter into a state of society, they cannot, by any compact, deprive or divest their prosperity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. That's a mouthful, but would you please, <laughs> res please, please respond because exactly what you just said is what George Mason said, it was the father of our Bill of Rights. Well, what's amazing, what made America unique, and this is something that was new to me. I didn't learn this in school. I, I just didn't. And it, it took me to be a mom and have a son who was totally acting up in his middle school that I brought him home and put on the I'm, I've got to be brave mom hat on and started homeschooling them that I started reading things about the founding of our country that I'd never learned before. And one of those things is what made our country unique is in our Declaration of Independence, when we declared independence from the rule of the king of Great Britain, is we believed and stood for that our rights come from a higher power than the king or the ruler or the magistrate or the emperor or the dictator. That our rights as human beings of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the ability to own our own property come from a higher power. And we called him God or divine providence or the almighty. There, there's so many ways that we called that higher power or, or that God. And that we, so we believe that rights come from him, that our right to live come from him, that our right to be free come from him, and that our right to be able to pursue happiness and to uh, own our own property come from him. And if they come from him, it means no man can take them away. Right. That's what we believe. That was that is foundational for what we believe as Americans. It's in our Declaration of Independence. Exactly that. So when George Mason mentions that we believe that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain rights when they are a part of a society that no one can take away. And he mentioned that and these rights are to enjoy life, liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Well, that's what all these Americans, the 12 million Americans that came to America through Ellis Island between 1892 and 1954, that's what they were looking for. That's what they heard about. That was golden to them because it was unheard of in all those European countries that, that um, they, they were coming from. They'd heard about this and that's what they wanted. They wanted that opportunity to have their lives be protected and to be able to be happy, pursue happiness rather than just 
eking out a living day after day after the day. Like you mentioned your grandfather from Ireland. Is that what you mentioned? Yes. So I didn't realize this, but a lot of Irish came, 4 million Irish came to America between 1855 and 1920 because they were trying to escape the unfair land owning conditions of Ireland, which resulted in widespread poverty and destitution. And in other areas of Europe, the land was divided into such tiny plots that it was impossible for the peasants to sustain themselves, let alone make a living. So they faced starvation. Well, do we have that in America? I mean, I know I've seen signs where kids are going hungry, etc. But we rally to their support and feed them and try to make sure everyone's got the basics, at least here in America, whereas there in Europe, they didn't even have the basics, food, clothing, shelter. Those are the basics. And here you have an opportunity to provide for yourself those basics. And then we're under... I believe, under obligation as human beings to help each other when we're down on a luck or, or whatever to feed the poor and clothe them. And that's what we did. We'll go into another story in, in the future of how there are organizations that were there at Ellis Island to help those people because often they were destitute when they came here to America because they sold everything they had and left everything behind so they can have that opportunity to be here in America and to become Americans. So immigrants that are coming to America today in modern America are coming for the exact same reasons that people came through Ellis Island over 100 years ago. We have a land of opportunity, and they see that, and they still believe that America is a golden door of opportunity. We want to invite everyone from 8 to 108 to listen, and please join us on We The Kids radio show and to hear more forgotten stories. Learn the principles of freedom that established unprecedented freedom in America so that we can all, whether we're eight or 108, preserve our freedom. Something to ponder for the next program is, why did your ancestors come to America? Why did they leave their native country and come here? And also you can check out the We The Kids website, wethekids.us for additional stories, insights, and activities that you can do with your kids to help them be proud to be American and to love and defend America's constitution. And you can purchase your own copy of Forgotten American Stories Celebrating America's Constitution on the wethekids.us website or on forgottenamericanstories.org. So thank you so much for supporting We The Kids and listening to the We The Kids radio show. Let's now join the We The Kids Liberty Players with today's guest, General Ulysses S. Grant. Hi kids, I'm Jack. And I'm Henry. We are the Liberty Players. And we're so excited to be able to share with you what we've been learning about the Civil War in General Ulysses S. Grant. I know. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be there? And Henry, where is our book? Jack, look! What? Isn't that? That looks like General Grant over there by the trees. Could it be? General Grant from the Civil War? Oh my gosh, it is. It looks like the picture of him in our history book. Come on, Jack, let's go over and introduce ourselves to him. General Grant, General Ulysses S. Grant, is that really you? Yes, it is really me. What can I do for you? I'm Henry, and this is my brother, Jack. Can we ask a few questions about the Civil War? Certainly you may. What would you ask of me? What exactly started the Civil War? The initial fundamental answer to that question is slavery. There are many different reasons that ultimately resulted in the war actually breaking out, but the bedrock issue is slavery. And you have to also think about different cultures, the North being essentially an industrial culture, the South being essentially an agricultural culture, two different types of peoples occupying one country, and the South being heavily dependent on cotton and slavery. In fact, cotton is the only commodity that was ever traded on the New York Stock Exchange that had its own name, King Cotton. And King Cotton was the chief export for the United States. So a great deal of money and the economy was involved in cotton. Cotton was being driven by slavery. Slavery had already been outlawed by most countries in the world by 1861. The United States and the South was vigorously supporting slavery. There had been a lot of contention and uh, arguing over as our country expanded to the west, to the California coast, about 
about new territory being slave territory or free territory. And uh, there was so much push and pull between the two sections of the country over which way the United States was going to be all free or all slave. So you also have to think about economic issues. As I said, North essentially, not totally, but essentially an industrialized country and the South being essentially agricultural and they have different needs, different desires to go through Congress and the House of Representatives and the Senate. So all of this pot boiling, all of these issues finally came to a culmination with President Lincoln being elected and it was known that he was not supportive of slavery, although he would have left it alone as it was and the South chose to break away. In fact, President Lincoln was not even on the ballot in the presidential election in seven southern states. All of these factors came together and erupted at 4.30 in the morning on April the 12th of 1861 in Charleston, South Carolina, when the Confederate States of America opened fire on Fort Sumter, which was the United States of America, and the shooting war began. April the 12th of 1861. General Lee surrendered to me in Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, in the Wilmer McLean home on April the 9th of 1865. So we've got, we're three days short of four years of war and the deaths of some 750,000 soldiers in 48 months, the horror that was the Civil War. But when General Lee surrendered to me, he surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia, which was not all of the Confederate soldiers. There were still several Confederate armies in the field. But General Lee was the General-in-Chief of the Confederate States of America, as I am the General-in-Chief of the United States Forces. And as soon as the other armies in the field got the information that General Lee had surrendered, they surrendered quickly. But this went through September, into September. So General Lee surrendered on April the 9th of 1865. The last Confederate Army surrendered in September. And I think I've said enough about causes and results, the war, and it finally ending. And I need to bring my answer to a close here. What else would you ask of me? Jack and Henry, time for dinner. General Grant, we must go home now. But can we meet again and ask more questions? We certainly may meet again and you ask more questions of me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And I hope that our paths cross again soon and often. Be about your business. Thank you. Henry, wasn't that just the most amazing thing you have ever seen? It sure was, Jack. Kids, please come back next week when we ask General Grant more questions about the Civil War. Until then, goodbye. We want to invite everyone from 8 to 108 to listen and please join us on We The Kids radio show and to hear more forgotten stories. Learn the principles of freedom that establish unprecedented freedom in America so that we can all, whether we're 8 or 108, preserve our freedom. 